Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the session. My name is Anis Sheikh. I work at uh, Google in the network operations team. Um, uh, I'm in the network architecture group within the operations side. Um, I was actually at an Open Daylight Mini Summit about a year ago. Uh, it was August of last year, talking about um, the management plane. And really, the theme of that discussion was around uh, how SDN has sort of passed by the management plane. And we focus so much on control and data. We have some fantastic technologies in terms of open control stacks like Open Daylight, um, open data planes like OVS and other virtual switches, and a bunch of other open networking technologies. But as far as the management plane is concerned, we still have a bunch of gaps that I will talk about today. And so the motivation of that talk last year was basically saying, hey, we have been focused a lot on SDN. Um, from a control and data plane perspective, but we also need to put a lot more emphasis on management plane because for network operators um, like Google and, uh, and, and many others, um, operations are really where we see a lot of the pain points in, um, in deploying new technologies and operating them. And I ended the talk last year uh, with um, some discussion of some ideas we had at that point about how we could do this work um, in terms of generating an open an equivalent in the management plane uh, in a collaborative fashion. So just as Open Daylight um, has leveraged collaboration and community to a large extent to build the stack and a whole set of features um, and is slowly improving in its maturity, um, we didn't quite follow exactly the same model, but we also are trying to leverage collaboration. And so this is sort of an update of how far we've come in the first year. So that was August last year, or just about in August of this year. Uh, so this is basically an update on, on where we are. So open config is um, sort of the brainchild that came out of some of those early discussions. And um, you know, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions uh, as we go along. So the motivation really was driven by all the challenges that we face in managing our, our network. So at Google, for example, we have more than 20 different roles of network devices. And for a typical service provider or a telco, I would expect to see many more. So I think we have a relatively simple network deployment, but still there's a lot of complexity and scale to it. Um, we have a multi-vendor network, as you might know, right? So we have more than half a dozen vendors in our network, and each with s several of those vendors, we have multiple platforms uh, from them. We have tons and tons of configuration that we need to manage, millions of lines of configuration uh, that we need to actively manage um, and maintain and there's tons of churn in the network, right? So we're draining links, draining services, adding capacity, removing capacity, redirecting capacity. All of these things result in configuration changes, not to mention failures that happen that need to be reacted to. So we have on the order of roughly 30,000 configuration changes in our network uh, per month. And then from the monitoring side, we're collecting huge amounts of data from our network. So more than 8 million object IDs from an SNMP perspective, you know, roughly every five minutes. And then we have more than 20,000 CLI commands that we're issuing to basically scrape information from devices so we can manage and understand what's going on in the network. And that's also sort of at a five minute time scale. So we end up essentially with many, many different kinds of tools, multiple generations of those tools, um, all sort of adding to the complexity of managing and operating our network. So there's plenty of opportunity here to get significant savings from an operational expense perspective. Um, you know, and the immediate impact would be around reduced outages, simplifying and consolidating our management stack, you know, better automation in terms of removing or reducing the number of manual um, interactions that we need to have with the network, and of course, better scaling. And so, as I said at the beginning, you know, we've had this whole movement. We live in the era of open networking now. Um, but what does network operations look like in this uh, brave new world of, of open networking? Unfortunately, we're still stuck with lots and lots of proprietary integrations. So from a management perspective, you know, openness seems to have passed us by. So whether it's through CLIs, through scripting, through templating systems, or you pick your favorite automation system, whether it's Puppet modules, chef cookbooks, Ansible minions, whatever you want, those have all helped us with automating our operations, but it hasn't gotten us away from all the proprietary integration that we need to do. The second, of course, is lack of real abstraction for managing the network. We're still managing the network by twiddling very kind of low level knobs in the network. And someone who has to, then the skills required to understand those knobs are significant and specialized. And we also don't have any real common APIs to actually manage the network. 
we still live in a world where configuration um, lives on devices. So the, the authoritative configuration is basically scraped from devices and then reasoned about in some management system. Whereas what you really want in a declarative configuration system is you have a centralized management system, logically centralized, in which the authoritative configuration is stored and devices actually are known to be in that configuration or they're reconfigured. Sorry. Am I going to lose my display? All right, let me keep talking while we're doing this. And then finally, um, on the monitoring side, we still live in a world where we're primarily relying on SNMP for monitoring. So we'd love to be able to use standard MIBs for monitoring, but where you typically end up is with lots of reliance on enterprise MIBs and proprietary um, data that you have to collect from devices. So what would an open management plane look like? So we've talked about sort of where we are today. An open management plane, in our view, has you know, three primary components to it. One is basically a common API. I said we lacked this before for configuration and for monitoring. So this API would work across vendor devices. So it doesn't matter what vendor device I'm using. I can use the same API both to configure the device and to read data from the device. Similarly, I want to have a new way of monitoring my network. SNMP, uh, I don't know if folks are um, experience with managing large-scale networks, high-density network devices. Uh, if you actually try to walk the MIB in one of these devices, um, as we get to thousands of ports, for example, just interface statistics might actually make the device fall over. So this is not going to scale as we go to next generations, as we get to higher and higher densities. So we need a new way to think about network monitoring. And so here, we view this as being realized through transport and RPC protocols that are open, that are built on a streaming model where devices actually stream the data to the management system, and that, of course, have security as a, as a first-class element. And then, finally, there's the notion of having an interoperable network-wide view. So this is about having a topology model that's common that can be shared between network devices and the management system. So there's a common understanding of what the elements of the network is, are and what the connectivity looks like. And so where this takes us is, shouldn't surprise folks here at Open Daylight, is towards a more model-driven way of thinking about network management, where we have models that define configuration. So models for configuration describe configuration data structures and content, models for telemetry or monitoring that describes the, the monitoring data in terms of its structure and its attributes, um, and then finally, <coughs> models for topology that describe the structure of the network. So with open config, we've really taken the approach of moving our management systems towards a more model-driven system uh, with a focus on configuration and telemetry. I'm not going to talk as much about topology models today. So I'll say a bit more about telemetry. Um, as I mentioned, we have some requirements for telemetry going forward that really require us to completely rethink the way that we do network monitoring. So in fact, I'll tell you that our goal, in, um, at least for our own organization, is to be completely SNMP free uh, in, a matter, in a matter of two years. So we don't want to use SNMP in our network anywhere um, uh, by 2017 if we can uh, get to that. So in this model, network elements is essentially push or stream data to collectors that you can see distributed in the network here. The data doesn't come across in some proprietary format. It's populated into a model that is common, and it's vendor neutral, right? So I can get the same data from all my devices, regardless of which vendor is actually sending the data. It has a notion of publish and subscribe, so I can filter data that I don't care about, and I can subscribe to specific data that I want, maybe at a frequency that I can specify. And as I mentioned before, we need a system that can scale with the next 10 years of density growth. If you look at the way switches are growing in density, routers and switches are growing in, in density, um, the mechanisms we have today uh, simply won't, um, won't scale. And then finally, we need a modern transport mechanism. So, and a transport mechanism that's open and that also has active development associated with it. Um, unlike SNMP, which I think has been relatively stagnant for a long time. So we have some ideas in this space you know, at Google, we just open sourced a transport protocol called gRPC, which is essentially an external version of our internal uh, RPC protocols, both the um, IDLs as well as all the um, uh, code and other mechanisms needed to realize um, both clients and servers. 
Uh, there's other options like Thrift. Um, for cases where you don't have the ability to actually encode data or, or set up um, you know, RPC endpoints, for example, if you're streaming data directly off hardware from the forwarding engine in a, in a router, um, you may have to settle for something simpler, like a simple protobuf that's just sent over UDP. So as we scale these devices, we're going to end up having to push more of the streaming and, and um, data collection from the management processors to the actual hardware. So we're going to have to adjust our transport accordingly. So guys, can we do something about the display? OK. Go ahead. Yeah, it could. I mean, I think here we would like to replace even the um, statistics that we get via S-Flow and have it all delivered via the same model. But yes, I mean, S-Flow at least uh, gives us some parts of these, uh, or meets some parts of these requirements, but, but not all. As in installed by us? Yeah, so the point of this is that um, it may very well require a new agent to be installed by the vendor. But as an operator, I don't care how you stream me the data. If you need to install an agent and that's your architecture, that's fine. So what we're seeing, though, is that some vendors think that they can scale uh, their systems such that you know, through the regular management channel, through the management processor, they can send all this data. Other vendors are saying, no, it's likely that we're going to have to split this up so that some of the counters, for example, that are coming from interfaces will come directly from the hardware forwarding engine. And then you have other statistics um, that will come from the management processor. So I think different vendors will have to go about this different ways depending on their architecture. But from a consumer point of view, I want the data in a common model and I want it streamed to me. So, and I don't care how you implement it on the device. Make sense? Yeah. I'm not worried about blasting the collectors. We have enough um, server horsepower that I'm not worried about distributing collectors. So we haven't concerned ourselves that much with that problem. I think that we have um, sufficient capacity in the management network to be able to handle the data at the rates that we're expecting. But if it does become a problem, then sure, I think that is an option, is to basically stagger the data collection frequency. And that would be part of the API, potentially, in which you specify the frequency and maybe period of getting um, the data back. OK, so this leads us to some of the motivation for open config. Um, basically, as I said, what we're finding is that management interfaces for devices are vendor specific. Within a vendor, they're platform specific, and sometimes they're even generation specific. Right? So where that leaves you <clears throat> is essentially with protocols that have been proposed that you know, still aren't solving the problem for us. Right? So we have NetConf, we have RESTConf, we have SIM, we have SNMP. We have a bunch of standard protocols, but none of these are really addressing the problem of these proprietary integrations that we have to do. And other people have argued with me when I've presented this before that, hey, what about Puppet and Chef and Ansible? Don't these solve the problem for you? I mean, the simple answer is no. I mean, they don't actually address this problem. They give you automation. They give you a different way of interacting with the system, but it's still through proprietary integrations. I need a different Puppet module for Apache and a different one for Nginx and a different one for whatever other browser I'm running. I don't have an abstraction for a web browser that is the same across different flavors. And so what this has done is push a lot of the complexity and cost of management basically to the operators. So it's being pushed from the vendor devices. And I'm not trying to beat up on vendors here. It's just a statement of how we kind of are viewing the world, um, where we have to basically build, integrate, and test a whole bunch of software tools that are managing all these proprietary integrations and all these variations. And if you think about it, if I'm trying to manage BGP on device A and device B from these two different vendors, is it really necessary that the syntax and the semantics of the commands be completely different? I mean, it's a standard protocol. The RFCs are out there. They've been published. The behavior should be more or less the same. So we have kind of are coming to the conclusion that we're doing a lot of this work to integrate um, that's really not necessary. And then finally, just from a skills perspective, you end up needing to have specialized skills just to be able to manage your multi-vendor network. So, uh, at Google and at many other service providers, you know, we don't want to be in a single vendor situation, right? We want to have multiple vendors in the network because it gives us lots of advantages um, 
just in terms of reliability, for example. And for doing that, it means that we are going to be living with a multi-vendor network. And I think every service provider or every network operator uh, is in the same situation. And what you end up having to do is have people who understand this particular platform really well or that particular platform, and they're ultimately configuring and managing the same thing. So what is open config? Let me say a little bit about it at a high level. Um, basically, it's informal industry collaboration of network operators. So we've got a bunch of network operators together um, who are working on defining these common APIs. So this is a case where um, it's users who are taking the job of defining the APIs and interfaces into their own hands. And our focus initially is on defining these vendor neutral configuration and operational state models. So operational state you can think of as the monitoring side um, based on real operations. So what we do is use our actual operational um, workflows and models and configurations to drive the development of the model. So we don't look at, for example, what standards have been published, what box A or box B supports. We look at our own configurations, what do we run in our network on a day-to-day -day basis, and make sure that the model reflects that first. So we don't try to be feature complete. We try to uh, reflect the actual use cases that we have. Our primary output today is basically model code. So we're not a standards organization. We don't publish that many documents, although we do publish drafts to explain the models. Um, but our primary output is, is it tended to be model code. We publish it as open source uh, via public GitHub repo. And I don't see Tom, but Tom Nato has helped us by giving us access to the public Yang model repo that he uh, maintains as part of his um, uh, NetMod uh, role in IETF. Um, you know, although it's a group of operators working together, we have really close partnerships with vendors as well. So we work with major vendors, and I'll say more about this, to drive native implementations of these models. It doesn't do us any good if at the end of the day we define this model and then we have to do the translation in our own management system to write you know, configuration and read data. What we want is for the devices to natively support these models so that we can use them to, to basically write configuration and read monitoring data uh, across different vendor devices. Can you talk about what operators yeah, just give me one more slide. So as we work with vendors, we have a couple of key requirements. One is that this is not something that's sort of a side project. It's something that's fully supported as part of the, the software stack on the device. And it's maintained as part of that platform software. And second, that it's available to all the customers. It's not just a special for one operator. It's not just a special for Google or for AT&T or for whomever. Um, it's something that becomes a feature of the platform, that it supports this common uh, uh, data model. And in addition, we also have a bunch of engagements with, with standards bodies. We're active in ITF. Um, we engage with ONF. Uh, we do work with other open source projects, you know, Open Daylight. Um, being a key one, Onos being another one. There's another open source project from NTT around a new BGP stack they're building. We've been working with them as well. And so you might wonder why is this, why did we do, formulate this as an industry collaboration? Why isn't it okay? I mean, why didn't Google just do this on its own or AT&T just do this on its own? Um, there's a bunch of reasons. I think they're fairly self-evident, right? One is just broaden the set of use cases beyond any single operator or customer. And it also simplifies life for vendors, right? If we can consolidate requirements and say, okay, here are the data models that a, a bunch of your biggest customers are asking you to support, uh, it makes the calculations for a vendor a lot easier in terms of where they should invest and where they should put resources in terms of supporting models. We also get, obviously, better quality models through wider review, subjected to more use cases. Um, and just the critical mass of having more people working on developing models is another obvious benefit. And then finally, every network operator has a different philosophy, a different set of technologies that they use to manage their network. So different network management system approaches are reflected in the set of participants. And we have to, and this sort of collaboration ensures that what we build is relevant across, uh, across all of those use cases. And so the question was about participants. Who else be us besides Google? Um, the set of participants we have so far in the few months that we've been um, working at this you know, include a whole bunch of different operators across uh, a spectrum of use cases, network environments, different vendor deployments, uh, different service and business models. So we have some traditional service providers or telcos. Um, we have some cable operators involved. And we also have a bunch of web scale network operators. Um, 
so we, it runs the gamut of all of these use cases. We're always interested in additional operators joining, um, especially on the smaller operator side. This isn't an effort that's necessarily limited to just large operators. Uh, we have put an FAQ together for operators, so if you represent an operator and you think you'd be interested in working with us, um, have a look at that FAQ. It's on our website, openconfig.net. Um, it just lists some of the guidelines that we ask people to follow uh, when they join um, the group. So this is an open source industry collaboration. First question that comes up, well, what's the governance model look like? Um, so the short answer is that there is no governance. There's no board, there's no steering committee, there's no bylaws, there's no chairman. We avoided any legal agreements, any certifications. Just imagine at these large service providers, if we got lawyers involved, we would be here a year later and probably still far, far away from having anything actually up and running. Uh, so we avoided all of that. And I have to give credit to our legal team inside Google because we saw that there's risk in this sort of model. Um, but they encouraged us to go ahead and just try to rely on essentially people behaving well and being transparent and uh, having a shared set of goals. So, so far, it's worked um, tremendously well. I mean, I think we're very pleased with the fact that, you know, using um, a bit of a radical model for formulating a collaboration like this across um, even competing network operators uh, has worked out uh, so well so far. So what we do operationally is we just have weekly um, working meetings, weekly working meetings, um, and the participants here are essentially engineers and architects who are closely involved with network operations, right? So that's one of the requirements that we have for operators who join. Um, you know, we, there are folks and operators that are in architecture teams, for example, that are a little bit distant from operations or folks who focus more on standards. Um, we really want to have folks who are very closely and intimately involved with operations, right? So, the, so that we can vet our models against actual operations. Um, so these are folks who are committing and actually reviewing uh, model code. And then we use GitHub to raise issues and discuss the models. We have our mailing list that we use. Um, and then we publish the model code, as I said, in a GitHub repo under an Apache license. Um, so it's a very simple uh, working model for this sort of collaboration. And we have some pretty big companies that have managed to work together and produce a bunch of stuff uh, over the last year. So I like this term that was coined by the new IP um, in light reading which is collaboration innovation. So I think this represents sort of a different model of how to formulate an industry collaboration. So the quote here is that the fact that these distinctly different and often competitive service providers are working together is an indication of the urgency they feel. And yes, I mean, there is an urgency to transform our network management, right? And this is one avenue by which we're uh, pursuing that. And then there was another quote about how open config serves to provide a testing ground for working out kinks before turning the specs over to the official consortia. So we're not starting with standards. We're starting with model code. We're actually using the code in our own management systems, trying them out in production, finding where there are problems, finding where there are gaps as far as what they can represent, iterating, and then you know, eventually, if um, we decide to pursue it and if the standards bodies are interested, uh, they may turn into standards. We hope that they will. So how do we go about this development of our models? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that come up about how do we work with vendors, how do we work with the broader community. Uh, we're definitely interested in doing that and we do a lot of that. So the way this works is that we have a set of operator requirements that we identify you know, through our meetings and discussions. We basically have built a roadmap of the models that we need to enable us to deploy, for example, our management system on a particular device role. Um, th so we start building these models after reviewing actual configurations, as I said. So the actual configuration helps us scope what needs to be reflected in the model. And then we develop and iterate on a draft of the, of the model. And I didn't mention, but hopefully people know that we've used uh, Yang as the modeling language, since that's where a lot of the industry traction has been um, so far. So we develop our model draft. We continue to review uh, our own configurations. We also spend a lot of time looking at vendor implementations. So we don't ignore what vendors are capable of doing. We actually only put things in models that are supported by major implementations, right? So it's, uh, we don't build the models in a vacuum without considering actually how they would map to a given implementation. And the mapping is not always perfect, but we try to make sure that there is a mapping from the model 
to the major implementations that we care about. And then we start the review process with the broader community. So we start with implementers, right? So we go to specific vendors and implementers and share the models, get feedback, revise the models um, based on their feedback. For example, we've made lots of revisions to the BGP model that we've worked on for the last several months based on vendors saying, hey, you know, if you change this container or if you um, move this to this part of the hierarchy in the model, it will make it a lot easier for us to do the mapping. And so we said, okay, we're not losing any feature by doing that. It still makes sense operationally to do that. So we go ahead and make that change. And then ultimately we can publish the model code as a more or less stable version of the, of the model. And of course, stable is relative here, right? So until you deploy it in production and use it, um, I think we don't claim that it's done, right? We have a lot of work to do to actually use it, work out the kinks um, before rushing to try to standardize it. Okay, I'm doing okay. So how far have we gotten um, over the last uh, year? So I think we've made a bunch of progress in a few different areas. Um, no. Are we, are we okay here? So we have a bunch of progress on uh, data models, right? Both for configuration and for operational state. Um, we've published a model for BGP and, and routing policy. They're actually two different models, but they work closely together. Um, we have multi multiple vendor implementations of the BGP and routing policy models uh, in progress, and I'll say more about that. Um, the BGP model has also been adopted by the IETF for standards track, which is great news because it makes life, again, easier for vendors. We've also proposed the routing policy model for standards track, and hopefully it's on track to become uh, to go on to standards track by being adopted uh, in the routing working group. Jeff can uh, comment. Okay, great. So uh, Jeff Tansura is, uh, is the co-chair of the routing um, working group in ITF, and that's where the routing policy model has been published. Um, we have a model for local routing. So, you know, things like static routes, aggregate routes, Locally generated routes matter to people, um, and we use them in our networks, um, and we need a model for them. So we have a model for that that we've published also in the routing working group. We spent a lot of time on an MPLS and traffic engineering model. It's another fundamental building block for operating our networks, right? So uh, we have spent a good deal of time in particular on the RSVP and, and um, traffic engineering portions of the MPLS model, as well as segment routing as a first focus area. But it includes a general framework for consolidating all of MPLS, including LDP and other protocols in one framework. So I think the difference between the approach we've taken with our MPLS model, for example, is that you know, operationally, we don't want to think in terms of protocol-centric. We want to actually look at our LSPs. We have LSPs that are signaled using RSVP. We have LSPs that might be signaled using SR. We have statically configured LSPs. But at the end of the day, we want to think about these as the set of label switch paths that we're managing. Not that, okay, we're managing RSVP, the protocol, we're managing LDP, or we're managing um, segment routing. So the idea of our model is essentially to create a single framework that consolidates all of MPLS in a way that we think is operationally uh, sensible. So it's a bit different than the approach that's been taken by the industry in, in developing MPLS models, for example. We also have published a device model. One interesting thing about Yang models, um, if you follow that area, is that uh, they're kind of built in isolation. And if you actually need to run um, a network, you need a bunch of these models that work together. So a device isn't just BGP or just MPLS or just interfaces. It's all of these things plus a bunch of other things that you need. And so you need a framework for a device that lets you put these models together in some sensible and coherent way. I'll say a little bit more about that. We've also spent a lot of time, not just on the models themselves, but also on proposing some design patterns for how you build models. So in particular, very little attention has been paid to how you model operational state in these models. It's really been focused on configuration. And we think, you know, as network operators, operational state and monitoring are key parts of uh, any data model that we are developing. And so we've come up with some design patterns and proposed them and published them and have been debating them. Um, in the community, as well as uh, some mechanisms of how you compose models. And then we also, you know, it's interesting, the explosion of Yang models. We have Yang models coming out of ITF. We have Yang models now being published by OpenConfig. We have a whole bunch of Yang models that have come from Open Daylight. IEEE is now starting to publish Yang models, MEF. So many organizations and so many sources of models. As a user, if you actually want to use the model, uh, you really 
have to kind of figure out how to wrap your head around all of these different models, where they come from, do they work together, are they implemented on any real platform. So the other proposal that we had that is slowly getting some traction is actually to, we're not sure where this should live yet, essentially is to have a catalog. Think of a service catalog from an IT services point of view, where you can actually have registration of models and some metadata about them that talks about you know, their licensing, their, what platforms are they're implemented on, what dependencies they have, um, and so on. So it makes it a little bit easier at least to go to one place to find out the set of models. So as a user, um, you know, I don't have to then go hunt around for figuring out all the different dependencies that a particular model I want to use uh, has. So continuing on with progress, we have a bunch of models that we're currently working on as well. So we've got an updated interfaces model and a system model. Uh, I'm mentioning these because there is a, a standard model that's been published by the IETF for both of these. Um, we've kind of taken a fresh perspective on them and, and looked at how they can be improved and extended. Um, we have a model for representing routing tables in a common format. This is a key part of our monitoring infrastructure, for example, and it's also used by network operators to debug their network, right, to really understand the contents of the routing table before policy, after policy, inbound routes, outbound routes, all of that. Um, we also have reviewed or, or uh, developed and now are reviewing models for optical transport devices. So towards um, deploying transport SDN in our networks, we have now a uh, terminal device model and we're gonna have an amplifier as well as uh, a rotor model that we'll be publishing pretty soon. We also spent a bunch of time on tools and APIs around modeling, so uh, Rob Shakir at BT um, has published a tool called PyangBind, which is essentially something that he's developed um, kind of on his own, but under the open config umbrella, uh, which essentially generates code artifacts from Yang models. You know, so if you are writing an NMS, um, in Python, for example, you can use his, uh, his tool to generate Python classes directly from Yang models and also do validation of the, of the data instances that you create. Um, we're also working on some protocol independent specifications of what configuration RPC should look like. Um, one problem with, um, that we've noticed with, with Yang is that it's very NetConf centric, right? So there's always this assumption that you're gonna use NetConf as the management protocol. Um, you know, we're not interested in using NetConf, for example. Other operators may or may not be interested in using NetConf. So at the same time, we think Yang is uh, very useful for data modeling. So what we wanna do is publish some specifications of what RPCs ought to look like regardless of what the underlying protocol is that you're using. And this is something that we'll work with uh, our vendors to implement. And then native implementation. So the first and most mature model that we published, or the first couple of models, is around BJP and, and routing policy. And you know, I'm happy to say that, that Cisco is, is supporting the models in iOS XR. So starting with release 5.3.2, you'll be able to configure BGP using open config data models um, on a Cisco device, both the virtual version and the real um, iOS XR uh, hardware. And then Juniper also is committed and is you know, publicly committed to supporting open config BGP and policy um, in Junos. And then we, we are talking to other vendors who have also committed, but they're not quite ready to publicly state their commitment. So we're, they have implementations underway and hopefully we'll be able to say more about them uh, soon. So I talked a little bit about model composition. I mean, this gives you some idea of what I'm talking about. Essentially, one problem with uh, Yang model development is that it happens in isolation, right? So to actually configure a whole device or a whole service, you need a multitude of models that work together. So we've tried to um, propose you know, a structure for how models can fit together to, for example, realize an entire device. And you know, one of the things that needs to be added, for example, to Yang is some um, mechanisms to help you build compositions uh, like this, right? Today, it's very difficult to do this given what Yang provides you with um, in the current uh, version of the language. I said, some, I said a little bit about operational state. You know, we essentially look at operational state as you know, three different types, right? You have typical monitoring data um, where you have operational state that's derived or that's negotiated uh, via protocols that are running. Um, so an example would be like your negotiated BGP hold time. That's one kind of operational state. The second kind is what you typically think of in monitoring, which are things like interface counters, right? Data, state data that comes from counters or statistics, uh, say from interfaces. Um, or you know, prefixes that are exchanged between BGP peers. And then we also have a third um, uh, category of operational state uh, that we've argued is crucial, actually, is uh, that representing the actual applied configuration. So 
if you think about it, you can view configuration as just another form of state of the system, right? So you have the state that's intended to be you know, written to the system, and then you have the actual applied state. And they may not necessarily be the same. If my system is not fully transactional or fully synchronous, there's obviously going to be a delay between when my intended configuration becomes the actual or the applied configuration. And if you're running systems as we do and as many people do that are asynchronous or that have eventual consistency behavior, um, you need to be able to monitor the state of the network, including its current configuration. So it helps you, for example, see when there's mismatches and to be able to reason about them. It helps you see how long it takes for an intended configuration to actually become an applied configuration. So we strongly believe from an operational perspective um, in open config that you know, the actual configuration uh, should be considered part of the state as well. And, and our design pattern for modeling operational state reflects that. Um, you know, we see clear benefits from using Yang to model both configuration and operational state data. You know, having them in the same data model um, gives you basically a bunch of benefits, including you know, having this common structure of the data, not just for what you configure, but also what you read from the device. And then, as I said, it allows for easy correlation between associated configuration uh, and state data when you have both of them in the same model. Um, but you know, so far to date, Yang has been primarily focused on configuration. I think even if you read some of the uh, IETF documents, you'll see that a lot of the focus is on configuration, although it does support um, operational state to some extent. Uh, and it's very NetConf centric. So if you're not using NetConf, um, you know, it's not clear that you can do everything that we want to do uh, in terms of modeling operational state. Uh, and we can talk offline more about that. And there's no common convention of how operational state should be modeled in, in Yang. And one of the design patterns that we proposed is essentially a common convention that models, uh, modelers can use to represent state data as well as configuration data. Um, so just a few observations. You know, my footnote on this slide is that you know, these are kind of my own views. They're not necessarily consensus views inside open config, but I will go out on a limb and say that uh, there's a lot of general agreement with some of these. Um, the first is that Yang and NetConf should be decoupled, right? They're both independently useful um, things, and they have been a little bit tied together, um, which has made some things complicated. You know, Yang as a language also, you know, it's, it takes a long time to iterate on it today. I think that Yang 1.1 will hopefully be published very soon, but it's taken uh, a very long time to go from Yang 1.0 to 1.1. And given the lack of sort of wide deployments of, of um, you know, Yang model-based network management systems, you know, our feeling is that we should try to evolve the language more rapidly as we get experience with it. Um, and then stabilize the language uh, you know, as real usage in production uh, increases, right? as we see real deployments out there. Um, the other issue that I think we've seen with Yang is that the folks who are currently driving the language represent you know, maybe a limited set of perspectives. I think what we need is a lot more review and more input from a much broader set of users that come with different perspectives. So from our point of view, you know, we're a consumer of these models, right? We're writing the models, but we're also on the user side. So there's also the, the vendor perspective. They have to implement support for the model on, their, on essentially what, on a server, right? On the, the network system. Um, there's also the perspective of folks who are writing Yang tools, compilers and parsers for Yang. So these perspectives haven't been equally represented. I think that's one of the problems with um, uh, Yang's development so far. And I think this is something that needs to change. Um, one real pain point that we've had, is, especially as you start to combine models together, is that if you look at how Yang models are versioned, they essentially have a date string. It's a revision date. Uh, it's treated almost like a dated document. It's like a letter that has a date on it, right? It's not a, treated like a software artifact that has a major version, and it's got a minor version, and it's got um, all the things that you expect a piece of software to have that gives you some indication about backward compatibility or when you can expect big changes to the APIs. Um, I think it could benefit from a real uh, bona fide versioning system uh, that wouldn't be that complicated. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, there are some standard models out there that I think we should be really open to revisiting and revising if necessary. Uh, the problem with the standard models that have been published is that they're not used widely in production, I think by everyone's admission, right? So we're in a situation where we have some models that have been you know, published as RFCs and we're naturally reluctant to go back and change them because they're RFCs. Um, but the problem is that they're not really used that widely yet. So our view is that 
you know, until models are actually used and in production and deployed and people have experience with them, we shouldn't rush to standardize any more models. Let's sort of stabilize them, get some real use out of them, um, iterate a little bit, and then we can think about uh, standardizing them. And that's the approach that we're taking in open config, at least. So we're at the Open Daylight Summit. What does this have to do with Open Daylight? So I wanted to first sort of introduce to some of you, some of you have heard this before, um, you know, open config uh, as another sort of industry collaboration around network management. But I think there's some real synergies with open daylight that I wanted to highlight and hopefully people will take away and, um, uh, and build on. So first is, you know, open daylight as a network management system. You know, open daylight was conceived and I was involved in the conception of open daylight in the early, early days, you know, as a control, as a controller, right? It's an open source controller, it's a control stack. Um, you know, if we start to think about open daylight as also potentially a really capable network management system uh, as a first class use case for open daylight, I think that could really uh, help us get to a point where we have an open, extensible system for network management in which we can try a lot of these ideas. Um, so I would really encourage there to be more focus on more uh, management and, and operations uh, projects. Um, the other sort of place where there's synergy is just support for the open config models. The open config models are, you know, open source, vendor neutral. Um, they're a good fit with an OSS project like Open Daylight. So one thing that we'd like to see and like to help with is, um, you know, helping Open Daylight cons consume the models and provide them as interfaces to some of the Open Daylight capabilities. And then finally, there's a really high concentration of Yang expertise in the Open Daylight community. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. If we want to see Yang actually succeed in the industry, we need much better tools. Um, we need to enable more experimentation with the language. I think Open Daylight can serve as a real catalyst for some of that. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about each of these. Some of these things are already happening, by the way, in Open Daylight, so I'll highlight some of that. Um, and by the way, you know, although this is, um, I think we have a great opportunity with Open Daylight, these comments that I'm making are not specific to Open Daylight. I think there are other open source projects that the same opportunities exist for, whether it's OpenFV uh, or whether it's uh, Onos and, and others. So Open Daylight as an NMS, <clears throat> the good news is that there's already a bunch of management and operations features in Open Daylight. So for example, uh, around monitoring and path management, we have things like SNMP and BGPLS and PSEP. And yes, I said we're not interested that much in SNMP, but the fact is that it's there as a protocol if you want to use it for monitoring. Um, we have some network configuration protocol support in terms of NetConf and RESTConf, as well as OVSDB. Um, there's support for data management and modeling. Of course, we have the Yang Tools project in Open Daylight. There's the TSDR project, which is for managing time series data. Uh, data. Um, and I think there's some additional capabilities that we should think about. Maybe a collector project, right, for be being able to collect the streaming telemetry that I described with, with um, publish subscribe capability. There's actually some very interesting drafts that have been published in ITF um, on pub sub. Uh, monitoring. It's in the context of I2RS, if folks are familiar with I2RS, um, but some of the ideas are sort of widely applicable there. Um, support for additional data transports and encodings uh, in terms of monitoring data. So, for example, gRPC or Thrift um, encodings, including JSON or Protobuf, uh, et cetera. And then also additional support for actually validating configurations. So I think all of these are potential opportunities for Open Daylight to extend its scope into management a bit more and actually help the operator community um, by giving us a way or a platform on which to try some of this stuff. Um, as far as supporting open config models in Open Daylight, uh, there's a few immediate candidates and you know, I saw Jan earlier today, but he was working with one of his colleagues at, at Cisco in terms of being able to support the open config BGP model. So <clears throat> I think pretty soon you'll be able to configure BGP in Open Daylight using the open config model. And I think there's other opportunities there uh, as well. So MPLS TE, our model has support for, um, you know, server-based path computation, like what you do with PSEP or segment routing. These are two other candidates that, you know, you, we might be able to use the open config models to configure those capabilities in ODL. And then finally, developing the Yang ecosystem, right? So I think the open config models have been a great, um, source of uh, input data essentially for the Yang tool chain in open daylight. And I, I've been working with some of the folks in the Yang tools project to, uh, to work out kinks both in their tooling as well as in our models. Um, uh, so that's been a helpful exercise. 
you know, the work that Open Daylight is doing to make it easier to visualize and experiment with models has been really great. I think if you look at the Yang UI project, there's a talk about it, I think, later today or probably tomorrow. Um, it's a really nice way to basically interact with Yang models and understand their structure. Um, it's very useful for people who are authoring models. Uh, there's also a bunch of projects now that are trying to take Yang models and generate code artifacts from them. Um, so Open Daylight is doing this for Java, obviously. Um, there are other projects out there that are developing um, code artifacts in Java out of Yang models. I mentioned the project that, uh, that Rob Shakir started on for Python. There are other projects that are doing the same for Go. So without some consistency across how these um, code artifacts are generated, it'll be very hard to interoperate. So I think this is another opportunity where we have to inter interact with the Open Daylight community to make sure that there's consistency in this code that's being generated from Yang models. And I'll emphasize um, this next point on, you know, I think we need a lot more work on improvements to the Yang modeling language. So uh, basically, you know, having a user or an implementer perspective that complements, you know, what's happening in the IETF standards uh, area. Um, to drive the language forward and to make it more useful. There's a bunch of major shortcomings that I think the language has uh, around things like lists and versioning, as I mentioned, how it deals with cases or choices, um, you know, lack of support for model composition, uh, that I think that, you know, along with Open Daylight and other interested parties, you know, we could start to address. Um, you know, if you're interested also in Open Daylight's view on this, you know, Colin gave a talk at uh, ONS um, recently um, I think it was called Yang Modeling, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So he also highlights some of the same issues uh, with the language. So wrapping up, <clears throat> um, you know, we believe from an operator's point of view that network management needs a much more model-driven approach, really, to make it um, part of the era of open networking and programmable networking and SDN. Um, Open config, as I've described it, is what we think is a new kind of industry collaboration. It's informal, but it's been pretty effective. I think you've seen the progress we've made over the last year. Um, you know, I'm, I think we're very, we're very pleased with it, but there's a long way to go, uh, obviously. Um, you know, in this model, we have network operators that are directly contributing the open data models, the tools, and the design patterns uh, for creating the models. Um, I think as we see more native implementations become available, so I already mentioned a couple that are in progress, it really has the potential to really transform the way we're doing network monitoring and configuration. I mean, having a common API and interface um, would basically remove the need for so many of these proprietary integrations that we're stuck doing today. Uh, and then finally, I think there is a major role for Open Daylight and other open source projects really to help realize uh, the vision. So with that, I'll stop there. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Yeah. Uh, you, the, the the so it's true that you know we're, we started by focusing on um, on hardware devices, but I think the same applies for for software devices also. I mean. Uh, probably the set of features that you worry about on an open vSwitch, uh, I don't have a BGP implementation I'm trying to configure like I am on a router, right? Um, but I do have interfaces and VLANs and um, tunnels and lags and things like that that may be applicable. So uh, certainly the models that we're developing around interfaces, it would be great if we could see more software-based devices um, adopt them. Yeah, so we actually presented um, in that working group recently uh, just to get some feedback from them and to let them know about what we're doing. Um, I wouldn't say we've fully developed that collaboration, but yeah, I, mean, I think we are in touch with them. They do know about the models. Um, we had some follow-ups. I think the, the main feedback was basically around things like terminology and so on to try to align it with the kind of terminology that they were using. Um, but I think that they saw value in the models that we're building. Okay.
Um, no, they're not expected to contribute back in terms of code, but and it's different for every vendor, right? So, but in general, the pattern that we've seen with the vendors we're talking to is. Um, all the vendors are building Yang models that reflect their own systems, configuration, and data models, right? So these are what we would call their proprietary data models. So they're working on those. Um, they now have the question of how to support externally defined models. So if a customer like us or like OpenConfig wants to, to use a different data model than their native model, it requires some translation, obviously. And that translation can be done a bunch of different ways. So you submit data according to one model, it has to be uh, transformed and manipulated so that it fits their native data model and then gets validated and applied, essentially. Right? So there's, that development effort is what's involved, essentially, in the initial implementation. So the sort of, although they don't contribute code directly back, we certainly incorporate the feedback that they give us on the models themselves. Right? The model has this feature that's really not supported in our platform. That may end up being a deviation in the model. If it's something that we believe should be in the model, it's just that that platform doesn't support it. Um, or it's something where we might reconsider removing it from the model because we find that it's just not widely supported. Uh, so that's the kind of feedback that we're getting, um, we want to get from, from vendors as we go forward. So you will see support on some of the platforms that I mentioned uh, for this model of streaming telemetry um, in the pretty near future, probably by year end. So it essentially, we're asking um, vendors to look at supporting different transports. So essentially, for example, in our case, uh, we're pushing for gRPC. gRPC is built on HTTP2. It's got a lot of nice features like bidirectional streaming and framing and you know security. Um, that we can leverage, and it gives us a way to set up um, a stream of data from the device. So, and we have a bunch of code artifacts that have been published. So, a vendor, if they can set up a gRPC endpoint on their end, you know, set up a, con a connection with our collector, it's just a matter of them then taking the data that they would normally make available via SNMP or some other mechanism, um, putting it in the data model that we've defined, right? So again, it has to be in the common data model and then streaming it to us. And there's different kinds of data, right? There's some data that you want over a continuous time series. There's some data you only want edge triggered. When an event happens, that's when you want to be notified. You don't need to know about it every five minutes or whatever. Um, and, and so we're working with vendors to actually support all of these different modes of of data over this new, these new transport mechanisms. And other operators in OpenConfig will ask for support for potentially other transports as well, um, aside from gRPC. Yeah. Of course. That's correct. I think the only thing I would modify in what you said is that um, they're not lowest common denominator models. We don't consider them minimalistic in the sense that they're everything that we need to be operational, right? And it's not just that we need, it's what all the operators who are involved need. So it represents a fairly full feature set. It doesn't have all the esoteric features that a particular platform may that include. Yes. Exactly. So vendors are free to augment the models with additional things. If I'm a customer of some vendor that uses some specific knob that only that vendor supports, I will need that augmentation to be able to operate my network anyway. Any other questions? Yeah. What would you say is the standard BGP model? I, I'm sorry, are you talking? 
not if it's specific to a single vendor. So for BGP, you know, things that aren't in the RFC, in whether it's 4271 or all the other RFCs that have been published that add features to BGP, um, unless it's used widely and implemented widely, we don't include it in the model. So as, and also we try to even, so knobs that, for example, reflect something that's standard but uses a vendor-specific terminology will actually, in the model, use the standard terminology. We'll try not to you know, follow a particular vendor's terminology or style. So we've actually tried hard to make it relatively uh, vendor neutral wherever we can. And that's what we mean by vendor neutral. It has to be something that's implemented by a bunch of major vendors. And I can't say that it's implemented by every vendor because it's the vendors that the operators who are involved in the group actually care about, right? So we ask them to go look at their um, implementations and see, is this supported? Do you use it? If you don't use it, even if it's supported widely, we don't include it. Because if no one uses it, why do we care about it being in the model? That's kind of the approach we've taken. I'm speaking a bit roughly here, but you know, that's at a high level the kind of considerations that we take when developing the models. I mean, the standard MIB for interfaces, for example, has some stuff in there, but there's a bunch of other things that are widely supported that we use in debugging the network that aren't in the standard MIB, right? They come in enterprise MIBs. So what I think you'll find is that the model has a combination of what's in the standard MIB, plus a bunch of things that are in various kinds of enterprise MIBs, and we've normalized the namespace for them and normalized their location in the data model. So. Um, if you're asking how different they would be, I don't think you'll find any surprises in the model. They're things that every operator uses and needs. Um, what we've done is try to you know, normalize the naming, their location, and even describe the semantics in enough detail so the vendors know exactly what we expect when we get that piece of data. Anyone else? Okay, thanks again, everyone. <laughs>